on the screen for you. We're going to be working on a, a message that we actually started last week. It's, going, it's called Moving Out in Faith. And we're in Matthew's Gospel, the 14th chapter. And starting in the 22nd verse, just to give you a little context, this is summertime, so even though our numbers are about the same, it's a different crowd for the most part. <laughs> so I get to tell some of my stories again, use some of my jokes <laughs> again. But we're in, in Matthew 14, and the context of this is Jesus had just had the miracle of feeding the 5,000. So here are his disciples who had seen this Wonderful miracle of taking a two-piece fish dinner and, th and an extra hush puppy and feeding 5,000 people with it. And so he tells them to get into the boat. And here we take it up in verse 22. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the other people home. Verse 23, and after sending them home, he went up into the hills to pray and night fell while he was there alone. Verse 24. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land. Now remember that at least a couple of these guys, two or three of them, were professional fishermen. They knew this lake. So for them to be in trouble, this was an extraordinary storm that had come up. And it said, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. And about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. And when his disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. Can you believe it? But Jesus spoke to them at once and said, don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. And then Peter called him and said, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. And Jesus said, yes, come. So Peter got out of the boat. Went, to, went out the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink and said, Save me, Lord. Verse 31, immediately, Jesus reached out, grabbed him, said, You have so little faith, why did you doubt me? Now just let that soak for just a minute there. He just got through walking on water. So if you can walk on water with little faith, what can you do with great big faith? <laughs> Amen. Faith comes from him, works through us, so we can ask for all we want to. We need big faith, Lord. And when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped, and the disciples worshipped him, saying, You really are the Son of God. Let's pray. We'll get into the message. Father, we love you. Thank you for just the sweet holy spirit that we feel this morning in this place dear lord move among us change our hearts change our minds transform us into something that looks a whole lot less like us and looks a whole lot more like you and dear lord we thank you for doing that miraculous thing and we just give you praise in advance for doing it in jesus name and the church again said amen i told the story last week about it it was a new pastor he was taking a new pastorate and decided to get acclimated with his new staff that they'd go on a camping trip. So they set everything up, had it ready for the new pastor. They, it's the, it's the pa new pastor, the, the minister of music, the youth pastor, and the children's pastor. So they get camp set up and decide they'll go out and catch him a little fish for supper. And they roll out there in the middle of the lake, a good spot, they thought. And somebody hand me a fishing pole. Minister of music said, oh, man. We forgot them. They're back on shore. New pastor said, no problem. I'm good and strong. I can row back to the shore. And he said, oh, there's no need. So he just jumps up, steps out of the boat, tiptoes over there to the shore and picks up the fishing poles. Tiptoes back, gets back in the boat, hands the poles to everybody. And the new pastor's just like, boom. All right, I've got my pole ready. Where's some bait? Oh, man, we forgot it. This time it was the youth pastor said, I got this one. So he tiptoes over there to the shore. Tiptoes back to the boat, hands them all bait. So the pastor's like, this is incredible. I have come to Faith Central. This is awesome. You know, these, these guys. And so anyway, it goes along. They, they forget the sandwiches. The children's pastor goes and gets them. So anyway, they forgot their, their ice chest with the Cokes in it. And 
The pastor finally, not to be outdone, says, I got this one. And so he steps out of the boat, all the way to the bottom. Sinks like a rock. And so uh, the minister of music looks at the youth pastor and the children's pastor, and he said, whenever he comes back up, would y'all show him the stepping stones? And here's the thing. In life, sometimes we see people doing nothing short of the miraculous. And what they've learned and what we need to learn is where the stepping stones of faith are. Whenever Peter said, Lord, let me come to you on the water, Jesus said, come, and y'all have heard me say this very, very often, but Peter stepped out of the boat and he said, C-O-M-E. Because Jesus said, come. And he was walking on the Word. As long as we're walking on His Word, as long as we've got our eyes on Him, then guess what? We can do the miraculous. Because with little bitty faith, Peter walked on the water. With great big faith, we can do things that people are going to look at and say, how are they doing that? And it's all about Jesus in us and through us and around us and the things that he does. It's not that we in, our, uh, in and of ourselves are any kind of superhuman being. It's that we have found some stepping stones of faith to be able to walk on. Amen? So, how do we do that? How can we, how can we find the stepping stones of faith? We talked about it a little bit last week. Uh, we actually got through one whole point, almost. And that first point is, tell God you're willing to take a step. That's the biggest thing, the biggest hurdle that a lot of us have to do is to be willing to say, God, here I am. Use me. Send me. Work in me. Let me be in on the, mir the miracle that you're working. See, Peter, that was the first thing he said. Whenever they saw the Lord, they cried out like little girls. Ah, it's a ghost. And Peter said, hey, 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 hey. I see a chance right here to get in on what Jesus is doing. So, Lord, if it's really you, let me come to you walking on the water. Faith is not the absence of fear. Faith is being able to move out in spite of your fears. They just got through screaming like little girls. It didn't say Peter didn't cry out, it's a ghost. Peter had some concerns. He had some fears. He had some doubts. So Lord, if it's really you, let me come out there where you're at. Sometimes we allow our fears. Fears has this amazing capacity to get our attention. Hurt, pain, has an amazing ability to get our attention. Faith is not the absence of that. Faith is being able to move out in spite of it. Somebody say amen. So, we talked about that last week. If you weren't here, be sure and get the CD. Chad loves to make CDs. Give him an opportunity to make one. Number two, when God gives you the go-ahead, go ahead. Amen? When God gives you the go-ahead, go ahead. Lord, if it's you, let me come on the water. What did Jesus say? Come on. And it took hearing that, it took moving out on that. There's several ways that we approach that. One is, we just jump. And in midair, oh yeah, Lord, I just jumped out of the boat. So would you keep me from drowning right here, right now? Because I done went ahead. We ask the Lord to get in on our stuff instead of saying, Lord, let me in on your stuff. Because if, if he didn't call you, you're the went one and not the sent one. Amen? And sometimes when you're the went one, you get way out there, and all of a sudden you're way far from shore, and you ain't got no business out there because he didn't call you to do it. Amen? Seen it happen so many times. Seen it happen in my own life. I was the world's worst. Whenever I first came to know the Lord, 
I would think I would see where he was going, what direction he was headed in, and I would just want to help him out. I mean, I'd run ahead and I'd start doing and fixing because this man this is right where he's headed. And the next thing you know, I look up and he's going in a different direction. Know that you know that you know God's called you to do whatever he's calling you to do. But when you get that go ahead, go ahead. Be the sent one, not the went one. Amen? The second thing is, the second variation on how we handle this is, Lord, here I am. Would you just use me? Would you just, would you just let me do something miraculous? Would you let me walk on that water too? Come on. I'm listening, Lord. I'm listening for your voice. I just want to know what you want me to do. Jesus said, come on. I'm seeking your will, Lord. And we ain't listening a bit more than a man in the moon. We're saying it. We're giving him lip service. God, here I am at your disposal. Well, I want you to quit your good job, and I want you to be a pastor of a church. Oh, I'm wanting your will, Lord. Just speak, O oh Lord, and I'll do whatever it is you tell me to do. I'm telling you, I want you to quit your good job. And I want you to go out and just trust me. Oh, I'm listening, Lord. All you got to do is let me just, just give me the unction. And I'm going to do what you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. Or mountain or plain or sea. But don't ask me to preach or teach or sing. And I'll be what you want me to be. Amen. Some of you that know that song know that's not exactly how it goes. Okay? But that's what we do. We give the Lord lip service. We tell Him we're listening. Tell Him, yes, Lord, we're, we're listening for Your voice. We're waiting for You to bid us to come. And He's saying, come. And we ain't listening. Amen? And the third variation on how we handle this sometimes... It's okay, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I want to be in on a miracle. And he says, come. Boy, that's a long way out there. Lord, you know, you know what? I just, ha just thought of something. I tell you what, why don't you let an island, a little peninsula, just come up right here in the middle of this lake because nobody knows there's an island out here. And wouldn't that be an awesome thing? What a testimony to the power of God if an island came up right between us right now and I could just step out like on dry ground. You remember that in the Old Testament? Whenever the children of Israel crossed over the Red Sea like on dry ground? Oh, what an awesome thing that would be, God. And better yet, if it's really, 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 really your will, why don't you let the Apostle John come over here and sit next to me and nudge me out of the boat? Amen. I knew this one lady one time, this is a true story. And the Lord had been dealing with her such a long time to get saved. And she would sit in the back of the church and she'd white knuckle grip that pew back there, I guarantee you, there was fingerprints in it. And she'd just sit back there and one day, I mean, it was just, the Spirit of the Lord was so strong on her. And what she said was, Lord, if you really, 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 really want me to get saved, then you let that little red-headed girl up there go up to the altar to pray. And that little red-headed girl got up and went up and prayed. <laughs> but you know what? The Lord doesn't want us seeking a sign. That's not faith. That's not what faith is about. Now, sometimes He will oblige us. Sometimes in His mercy and His awesome grace, He will oblige us to give us a sign. But you know what true faith is? When He says, come, that we step out of the boat. C-O-M-E. To Him. Not knowing how it's all going to work out. Not knowing whether we're going to sink or swim. But I know that I know that I know that I know. I had a pastor's wife one time. She taught the adult Sunday school class whenever I was just first saved. And she said, sometimes you just got to know it in your knower. And when you know it in your knower, 
There's no better feeling on this earth. You get, there are fears there. You will never overcome all your doubts. You will never overcome all your fears. Do not wait for that. To step out in faith toward God. But the thing is, when you know in your knower, this is what God wants me to do. There's no better feeling on this earth than to step out on that water. Amen? Somebody give the Lord a big hand clap this morning. So, tell the Lord you're willing. And whenever you get to go ahead, go ahead. Amen? Third thing. I'm going to say this. Take three back. We're still on two. I just thought of something else I needed to tell you. How do you get the go-ahead? I know somebody in here is asking me right now, how do you get the go-ahead? How do I know that God is calling me to do it? How do I know that I'm truly hearing from God? Because see, Peter could see Jesus, and Jesus was right there, and he could hear him. There was no limitation in the physical world. But there's a little bit of limitation in our physical world. So how do I get the go-ahead? I can't tell you exactly how it's going to work for you, but I can tell you how it works for me most of the time. About 50% of the time, 50 to 60% of the time, the Lord uses something in His Word to speak to me. It has been an amazing process through the years to see that whenever I'm seeking God's will, that all of a sudden it doesn't matter what I pick up. I might pick up my Bible, I might pick up a devotion, I might turn on the TV or the radio onto a Christian station. And the same thing keeps playing over and over and over and over. I might turn it on and hear somebody preaching, and they're preaching about what, I'm, what I've been thinking and praying about. It might be that I pick up the Bible and I, I turn to a scripture and all of a sudden there's the Lord still talking to me about that same thing. About 50 to 60% of the time, that's what it is. God works off our overflow. Amen? God works off our overflow to us and He works off our overflow to other people. God doesn't want you pouring yourself out completely. We got to work at it, and we got to stay in touch with him, and we got to stay full of his word to the point that we're like a well, like an artesian well, bubbling over. And guess what? I've seen it happen so many times that off of our overflow, it might have been something I read last week, it might have been something I read a month ago, but the Lord just kept it, as I always say, simmering on the back burner. Sometimes the Lord will keep something on my back burner for a long time. I'm talking about months. And sometimes I don't know if it's for me or if it's for somebody else, but about 50 to 60% of the time, the Lord speaks through His Word to me. There's about another 25% that the Lord uses somebody, some godly person around me who is letting their overflow flow. You stick with me on that? Letting their overflow because they're they, they're full of it. No, they're not full of it. They're <laughs> I'm just testing you. See if he's awake. They're full of God's word and full of God's presence, and all of a sudden they say something in a conversation, or I might even ask their opinion on it. Here's the thing: God, the Bible teaches us there's wisdom in godly counsel. Ask somebody that you know that knows God. I mean, you don't want to ask some goony bird out on the street that doesn't know God. Amen? Ask somebody that you know that knows God. Hey, man, this is, this is what God's dealing with me about. What do, you, what do you think? And if they're a godly person and they're full of the Holy Spirit, they're not going to tell you exactly what to do. But they're going to say, you know, this is what God was speaking to me about that. Or this is what I read. Or this is what I know. From my own experience. God has never allowed me to go through something that he didn't turn around as a point of testimony and a point of ministry somewhere in my life. Every hurt that I've ever gone through, that it sometimes I thought it was literally going to kill me. There have been some things that we have been through in ministry that literally I thought it was going to kill me. It was breaking my heart. I thought it was going to bleed to death from a broken heart. 
And God always turned that around. That I could tell somebody. Might be a year or two years or five years down the road. Let me, let me tell you about how God can heal that. Let me tell you about what God can do through brokenness. The Apostle Paul is one that he speaks over and over and over about all the hurts and things that he's been through in, in this life. And the thing that we see is God always turned that around for a point of ministry. The Apostle Paul, this is one of the things, and y'all, those of you that come on Wednesday night, you know I like to get in on the, dig deep on the Word. And I was just looking at it not too awfully long ago. Paul, the Apostle Paul, uh, God using him, God spoke to him, knocked him off his horse, you know the whole story there, and he just comes on fire for the Lord, and he goes and he starts winning people, and this guy is like on fire for ministry. And finally goes to Athens, Greece. And he is going, man, he is going to plant a church there. And he has been winning souls like crazy. And he goes to Athens and he tells them about this God. This was the, the cultural and, and educational center of the known world at that time. And he tells them about Jesus and they yawned. And if you look at it and put all the pieces together, Paul left Athens really and truly a broken man. His spirit was wounded. Because he couldn't get through to him. The, one of the most, one of the biggest failures that he ever had, if you want to call it that. And he leaves Athens and he goes to Corinth. A different person. Because he had been injured, he had been wounded, his heart was broken. And he goes to Corinth and he finds this group of people. And he stays with them longer than he ever stayed with anybody. And plants an awesome church in the midst of of one of the most sinful places. It'd be like, it'd be the equivalent of going to Las Vegas and planting a huge church. Sin City. That's what Corinth was. And so God always uses the things that we go through. So here's the thing. He's going to speak to you through the Word, His written Word, the things that He's already written down, and the Holy Spirit's going to bring it to life in you. Then about 25% of the time, the, uh, this is for me, it's not may, your percentages may be a little different. About 25% of the time he uses people around me, godly people, with good counsel. And the other 25% of the time, the Lord speaks to me out of the blue through the Holy Spirit. I might be driving down the road and not even have had a thought about anything pertaining to what he instantly, it's just like, boom. Y'all have heard me talk about it before. It's like getting a download. You know how you get your computer online and you can't really see where it's coming from, but you have clicked the button and all of a sudden, there it is. I'll never forget. There have been several times in, in my life, as I said, about 25% of the time when it's just bada boom, bada bing, there it is. I'll never forget. It was in March... 2010 and I'm getting ready on a Sunday morning just like this Sunday morning and I'm getting ready to go out to share the message that I felt like God had shared with me given me to share and I'm at the corner of my desk putting on my microphone not this microphone but another microphone putting on my microphone clipping it on my belt had the same setup so I'm clipping that on my and it was like boom out of the blue had never even considered and God said it's time for you to go excuse me <laughs> I must be nuts <laughs> I literally I did I spoke out loud what so I didn't tell anybody man that's the kind of stuff you don't tell mama that you're fixing to move because if mama ain't happy ain't nobody happy and mama was pretty happy right then <laughs> so I just kept kept it to myself sometimes you remember whenever the Lord came and spoke to Mary said you're fixing to have the Messiah you, it's something you just don't run out into the streets oh, I'm going to have the Messiah said she kept all these things in her heart and pondered them this is one of those times when I kept all these things in my heart and I pondered them. And so I'm, I'm praying. I said, Lord, I, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not networked. 
We're not in a denominational church anymore where I can call the bishop and have, have myself put on a roll of people looking for churches. You're going to have to work all this out. This is your idea. <laughs> it ain't mine. <laughs> so it's all about you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I mean, I'm telling you, losing sleep, not eating, if you can believe that. <laughs> and just seeking God. About two weeks later, three weeks later, there was somebody in the hospital. We, uh, the nearest, bigger hospital was about 25 miles from where we lived. There was a little hospital in that town, but it was good for veterinary work, <laughs> that kind of stuff. If you had something major, you wanted to go to the next little town. So we had gone over there to do a hospital visit, just me and Angie. The kids were somewhere, friends, or I don't remember, maybe with my folks. We talked all the way over, talked on the way back, got us some supper. We were about halfway back home. Things got kind of quiet in the car. Angie says, you know, I've really got the inkling lately that it may be time for us to move on. So I say, really? <laughs> I said, well, when, where did you come up with that? And she said, I just feel like that's what the Lord's saying. I said, well, when did this come about? You know, I'm playing it, man, I'm playing it really, really close to the vest. And she said, it was about two or three weeks ago. I said, really, when? She said, well, it was the weekend about two or three weeks ago. So as best we can figure, if it wasn't the same very day, it was the same weekend. See, God knows. And God knew that she had to know it, but I couldn't tell her. No, 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 no. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't bode well coming from me. <laughs> and God had to tell her. But the thing that I'm telling you is, sometimes it's going to come to you out of the blue. And we had planted that church up there. We had things were going well, as I've shared with you many, many times. It was the last thing on my list. Fact is, we'd been working hard for eight years, and to me, it was a time to like, whew, we've done well. Let me just sit down and rest for a minute. God said, uh-uh. No time to rest. Time is short. And you know what? God has gone every step of the way with us. Amen. <laughs> You're stepping out in faith. God will meet you there. You know, the thing that we are so concerned about is what about me? And it's human nature. It's part of how we're wired. What about me? What about my stuff and things? Stuff and things are such a huge hindrance to us because we're always worried about our stuff and our things. God will, God will tend to your stuff and things. He said, if you'll seek the kingdom first, all these other things will fall in the line. But here's the thing. God knows the beginning from the end. He knows exactly what it's going to take. He knows, he knows exactly where you're at. And I was checking my time before she lands the plane on me. Um, I'm <laughs> concerned about whether to go on. We'll at least start number three. Because the biggest thing that we do is we get paralyzed by fear. Peter had some fear. He just screamed, It's a ghost! Can't tell me he didn't have a little fear. You can't tell me he wasn't concerned because what did he say? If it's really you, let me come to you on the water. He had some doubts. He had some concerns. He had some fears. And that's what paralyzes us. We start thinking about our stuff and things and how's all this going to work out and what are we going to do and da 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 da. And number three is the answer. If you start to sink, ask for help. Okay, Peter steps out of the boat. Big move of faith, big leap of faith. And he goes C-O-M-E. And all of a sudden, ooh, these waves are bigger than they looked out of that boat. And that wind is really blowing. <laughs> Here he goes. Starts sinking. Was the first thing he did. 
Lord, help me. I don't believe it was like, <clears throat> excuse me, Lord, if you could spare a moment, I believe he, I believe he hollered. You know, you just got to look at Peter's personality. I don't believe it was quiet and reserved. I believe it was, Lord, help me. I'm sinking. See, God is infinite, and we are very, very, very extremely finite. I can't see the future. I know some of you are amazed at that. Sometimes I have a hard time remembering the past. I knew I could get at least a couple of amens on that one. And so here's the thing. We are limited in time and space to right here. Oh, wait. Right here. Oh, wait. Right here. Because every time I say that, time just clicked off another second or two. We can't go back and change what, what happened, and we can't move forward and see what the next moment's going to bring. And so we are paralyzed sometimes by not knowing what's next. And we can talk ourselves out of anything. You can talk yourself out of an absolute, positive, wonderful, awesome miracle if you let yourself. One of my biggest, my, my biggest enemy is not the devil out there. Sometimes it's the devil right here. And sometimes it's the devil right here. Psst. What's going to happen if you fall? Psst. If you give up that big job, what's going to happen? Remember all your stuff and things. And you know what? If we'll let him... We'll get back in the boat. The other 11 is in here. They're doing all right. Need to ride, Jesus? Because we allow ourselves and the enemy to talk us out of what God said do. When I surrendered my life to ministry, and it was a, a lot of ins and outs for me. I had not been raised in church. I didn't know what this thing was all about. Got saved when I was 23, 24 years old. New to this whole deal. Man, I'm just feeling this tremendous burden to help people, serve people, share the gospel with people. I didn't know what a call into ministry was supposed to feel like. I'm me. I've always been me, never been anybody but me. So I've wrestled with that for a year. You know, what is this? I'm just miserable. Just felt like I needed to be doing more and, and just so I was wrestling with all this and we had a men's meeting. Uh, it was go out to eat, kind of a meet and greet thing. And we had all met at the church that I was in at that time, and all the men took off together, vans and stuff, so we wouldn't have a bunch of vehicles headed to where we were going to eat. And so we get back there, and it's my, my pastor and a good friend of mine and a, a, a guest speaker that we had had coming in for the weekend. He spoke at the men's thing. and So I'm like, guys, we're here at the church. Could we just go in and pray? Because I just got this, I got something on my heart. Could, would y'all pray with me? Seeking that counsel that I'm talking about. So I knelt down at, at the altar, and, and, I, and I'm telling you, I just broke. I just fell like a ton of bricks. And I bawled my eyes out. And I said, God, I'm so miserable because I, I feel like I need to move out. I feel like I need to do more. I feel like, I, I feel like this is what you're calling me to do. So here I am bet you're happy because <laughs> you sure got a prize here <laughs> and i'm just like lord how could you even use me you know i don't know this stuff I'm, i was i didn't cut my teeth on a pew how are you going to use me and i just gave it all to the lord right there 
I mean, there were snot and tears all over that altar. And so I stood up and I told my pastor, good friend of mine, and this guest speaker that we had in over the weekend. I said, <laughs> and they asked for an interpretation to that. <laughs> and I said, I feel like God's calling me into ministry. And I don't know how this is going to work. Because I don't know. But the one thing I know is if, I've, if I make a wrong move, God will set me straight. He'll put me back where I need to be. But I'm stepping out in faith. And from that point on, it was like a different world. Number one, my pastor was one of these types. He said, well, if God's calling you to preach, why don't you just preach next Sunday night? <laughs> Are you kidding? I never much more taught Sunday school. And so I worked hard, studied about 60, 70 hours that week. Might have preached eight and a half minutes. But you know what? It was a step of faith. He didn't say you had to go big. He just said, go. And I know that I know that I know that God's dealing with some of y'all too. It might not be about preaching. It might not be even about ministry, but maybe it's business. Maybe, maybe God's giving you a business idea. And you're just saying, man, that, don't even make, that don't, just doesn't compute. God's, God's setting you up to succeed. Maybe it's that you've never been involved in anything before, and you're saying, God, I, just, I feel like I need to help. So here I am. You know what? He'll meet you there. It might be that God's calling you into ministry. It might be that God is, is just setting your feet on fire. I've got to go, got to do. You know what? God will meet you there. Doesn't matter what he's calling you to do. And he's calling all of us to do something. It doesn't matter what it is. He will always meet you there. And if ever you should begin to sink, guess what? He's there. What does it say happened? Peter cried out and instantaneously. Bring that verse up again, Piper. I think it's about verse 30, somewhere in there. I don't, without going back and getting my Bible. Let me see your Bible a minute, bro. Oh, got it up there. When we saw the wind, strong wind and the waves, he was terrified, began to sink, and said, Save me, Lord. Next verse. <clears throat> Immediately. It didn't say he took Peter by the head of the hair and kind of dunked him under the water and said, You're a rascal, are you? <laughs> That's how some people view God. I met one lady one time. She said, I just feel like God's just waiting to knock me over the head every time I turn around. Well, you serving the wrong God. Because <laughs> mine ain't like that. Immediately, he grabbed him. You have such little faith, that, but you walked on water. Why did you doubt me? Go to the next verse, Piper. What's that second word? Not only did he lift him up out of the water. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow you for a minute, brother. Not only did he lift him up out of the water, but Jesus put his arm around him. And I think they walked side by side back up there to the boat. And they're back in. Jesus will never take you so far that he can't get you back. Amen. He told Peter in the very beginning when he called him, he said, push out into the deep water. Why? Because nobody else had ever been there. I'm telling you, Jesus is wanting to stretch our faith. Amen. He's wanting us to believe bigger than we've ever believed, and he's wanting to accomplish more through us than he's ever accomplished. And you know what? All we got to do is say, Lord, I want to walk on that water too. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm sorry if I kept you a little long today. Just felt like I needed to finish that. Lord, we, we love you.
and you have stirred me lightly to know that I know that I know that you're wanting to do some awesome things in us, through us, around us. You're wanting to be a part, us to be a part of miracles. And God, all we can say we don't know how all this works, but Lord, we know you. So Lord, here we are. Let us come to you on the water. Thank you, Lord, that you are a miracle work in God, that you still speak to your people. Regardless of what some people say in this day and time, you still talk every day. I think every hour and every minute, you still speak to your people. Thank you for caring about us that much. Give us ideas. Let us have visions. Let us have revelation. But Lord, make it very, very clear so that we know, that we know, that we know exactly what we're supposed to do and exactly where we're supposed to step out. Thank you, Lord, for doing that. While every head's still bowed, every eye's still closed, maybe you're here today and maybe you're saying, Brother Philip, I don't even know God like you're talking about knowing Him. Maybe I'm like you talked about. Maybe I... I didn't grow up in this thing. Maybe I, maybe I just don't even know what it's about, but I feel like today I've got to make some things right with God. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you up front. I'm not going to call your name. Fact is, nobody's even looking around. But if that's you and you say, I need to make things right with God today, right here, right now, would you just slip your hand up so I can pray with you? I just need to make things right with God. I see that hand. You can just slip it up and back down. I see that hand. I see that hand. Anybody else? Very quickly. I just need to make it right with God. Yes, yes. Anybody else? You can just slip it up and back down. Yes. That's a step of faith. You just leaped out of the boat. Right there. By saying, God, I want to get things right with you. You just set yourself up to receive from God. So let's pray. If you raised your hand, I want you to pray this prayer. I want every born-again believer to pray it with them. Dear God, here I am. Warts and all, forgive me for all those things that I've done to miss the mark. Would you save me? Lord Jesus, I accept what you did on that cross for me. You died in my place. You died for my sin so that I could be with you in heaven one day. But while I'm here on this earth, would you lead me? Would you guide me? Would you direct me by your Holy Spirit? And I thank you for loving me and saving me in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Give the Lord a big hand clap for that. Amen. Now I'm going to pray. Maybe you're here today and maybe you say, I know the Lord. Maybe you say, hey, I'm okay where that's concerned. I've got a relationship with God, but I just need to know what to do, when to do it. I'm going to pray the Lord to make it clear. We pray one more time. I want our deacons to get ready to receive this morning's tithe and offering. Lord, again, here we are. We're giving ourselves to you. And Lord, so many of us, we just need to know what you want us to do. Lord, just that first step. We don't have to know the second or the third or the fourth. But God, just show us. Open that door to wherever you want us to go. We pray that you'd open all the right doors, close all the wrong ones. Lord, don't give us an opportunity to even miss them. But God, that in your mercy and your grace, that you would... Throw that door that you want us to walk through. Throw it wide open. Let us be able to see that that's the path for us. That we would know in our knower exactly what you want us to do. And when to do it. And God, that you would be with us every step of the way. Give us that assurance, Lord. We're not going to get rid of the doubts and concerns. But God, give us that assurance to know what we need to do. You told the, the prophet Habakkuk to write down the vision to make it clear so that anybody even running by can read it and see it and know what the will of God was. So Lord, do that in our lives. Let us let it be so clear that we can just 
run right along and know exactly what we need to do. Make it, make it exceptionally clear to us. Sometimes we're slow to listen and slow to hear. And, and, and God, we, we want to we hear your voice. We want to know your will. And so, Lord, work in us and through us and accomplish great things. And we thank you in advance for it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Our deacons are going to come and wait on you for the tithe and offering. If you're here for